Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew. What had Jesus heard? Jesus had learned of John the Baptist's horrible death. John had been arrested by King Herod for making public the adultery that King Herod was engaged in with his brother's sister, Hardonia. And King Herod would have liked to have killed him right there, but he was fearful. He was fearful that John's followers would rise up because John did have quite a reputation as a prophet. It had, then came Herod's birthday, an extravagant affair with a great deal of wine and dancing, and his nimble young daughter of Herodia danced for the king. It greatly, the king was greatly pleased by her performance, and the besotten king in that moment vowed to give her anything she wanted, and what she asked for was the head of John the Baptist on the platter, and her wish was granted. One biblical interpreter writes, Herod's guests were served up a ghastly entree that must have ruined their appetites for years. John's followers were allowed to claim the body, and then they went and told Jesus. Do you remember where you were on the day that you heard the news that John F. Kennedy was assassinated? Do you remember how you felt on the morning of 9-11? Have you ever in your lifetime received one of those dreaded phone calls? Your stomach hurts and your heart contracts and you can barely take another breath. And inside you're screaming, no, this can't be. But outside, you're doing nothing because your muscles and your nerves have gone completely numb. The Bible doesn't say a lot about the relationship between Jesus and John, but one could guess that it was a close one. When Mary was pregnant with baby Jesus, she went to visit her relative Elizabeth who was pregnant with John, and John leapt with joy in the womb of his mother. Maybe we could imagine what it would be like for those two boys to play together during family celebrations. Can you just picture them kind of kicking back as teens in their, in their dad's workshop? Maybe mucking around with dad's tools, building something together? Author Chilton imagines that Jesus stayed fairly close to home in young adulthood because he learned Joseph's trade. Well, John got religion and went off to study in the unseen biblical college in the desert. And then John started to make a name for himself by preaching and by baptizing. And Jesus went to check him out, and his whole life changed. When John baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended on him, and his ministry began. So it's not just John the Baptist, the prophet, who's died. It's John, Cousin John, Buddy John, Brother in the Lord John, who was with me when my whole life changed. That's the John that Jesus has lost. <coughs> and so when he heard this, he withdrew. He climbed in a boat to get away, to find a quiet place to grieve, to cry, to kind of make sense of it, and to pray. The word spread. From village to village, more and more people heard of John's death, and in their shock and in their grief, they came out of their homes. In their spiritual hunger, they came and sought out Jesus. He had gone looking for solitude and was confronted by a multitude. And when he looked in the eyes, when they looked at those people in the eyes, did he see that same sorrow that he felt? Did he see hurting hearts? Did he feel the, their hunger for his presence? Matthew just says he had compassion on them. The word compassion means to suffer with. And Jesus spent the rest of that day with the people, healing them. Maybe he grieved with them. Maybe he taught them. Maybe he prayed with them. Maybe together they tried to make sense of the magnitude of John's sacrifice. But Matthew just says, 
he healed them. In the midst of his own pain, Jesus had compassion on the crowds and he healed them. And we can learn two things from this demonstration of selfless love. First, Jesus is God incarnate on earth, and so this event shows us Jesus' human side. When he learned about the news of John, it hurt, and he needed time and space to work that out. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, knows about <coughs> personal loss and about the emptiness caused by the death of a loved one. Not just from a, a loft divine perspective, but because he's experienced personal human loss. Circumstances didn't really allow for much personal grieving because in the midst of his own grief, Jesus looked and he saw the hunger, the, 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 the hurt in all that thousand people gathered. This teaches us, this gives us assurance that God knows, God cares, God understands, and God heals. No matter what happens in your life, motorcycle accidents, car accidents, relationship issues, illness, job losses, even global crisis, it doesn't matter. God will be there waiting to help us heal. So first we learn about God's compassion and the ability to work in our lives to save us. And the second lesson is about us. Jesus sets an example for us. We can recover in our grief when we stay connected to our community. When loss comes into our lives, it hurts. It hurts emotionally and it hurts physically. And sometimes you just feel like curling up in a ball in a dark room and letting the whole world just come to a screeching halt. There's a time for grief, for crying, for retreating, and there's a time for letting friends back in. There's a time when we look through the blur of our very own tears to see that others share that same pain and want to help. There's a time for coming back to church, even though you might still cry when a certain song is played or when a certain prayer is said. And there's a time when you begin to lift your eyes a little higher and you begin to notice the needs of others. As we begin to work on the healing of others, we find a deeper healing ourselves. I have worked with teens who were depressed because they didn't fit with the in crowd. But they found joy and a purpose in life by coming to volunteer at a nursing home. I have worked with new widows and listened to their life stories and helped them cope with those unexpected changes that come from suddenly being single after decades of marriage. But I saw the most healing in their lives when they coached another widow through those same stages of grief. And this week on the nightly news, I heard about Rachel's cause. Last month, nine-year-old Rachel had heard about other children who needed wells. They lived in far-off lands, not even in her neighborhood. But she believed that she could help. Her big crazy idea was to raise $300 by foregoing birthday presents and asking people, instead of giving her nine-year-old birthday presents, if they could contribute to the water fund. She wanted to raise the $300 so that 15 children, 15 thirsty children, could have clean water to drink. But last weekend, having only raised $220, she was killed in a car accident. Her parents figured the best memorial was to keep Rachel's cause going. This week, over $615,000 has already been raised in response to this young girl's selflessness. Now, I'm pretty sure that her parents are still in deep grief, but a ray of hope is shining because parents, <coughs> Rachel's parents did not shut out the community. Rachel's cause is going to be bringing water, not to just 15 people, but by my calculations, 
to at least 30,750 people. Not every story is as big as Rachel's, but time and time again I see healing when people follow Jesus' example and reach out to others and turn towards their community in their grief. Greg Gilbert told me this week that our church, our body of Christ, was composed of the walking wounded. Men and women that had suffered physically or emotionally or mentally, and yet in the midst of their loss, they continued to minister to their church and to their community. Amen. What a good example you already are. Another phrase that strikes me when I read this scripture is the response that Jesus gave his doubting disciples. He said, you feed them. Marjorie Thompson in her book about prayer writes that human beings are innately religious. We harbor a bedrock of desire for a transcendent wellspring of meaning and purpose in life. We are made for a relationship with God. Therefore, until that relationship is sought and found, there will always be an emptiness in the core of our being. We are made to be hungry for Christ. And yet, Jesus says, you feed them. Maybe the crowds that sought Jesus were hungry for his presence and he healed them. But when nightfall came and the disciples see that the people are physically hungry for food, Jesus says, you feed them. And with Jesus' help, they do. They feed all that are gathered there and they have leftovers to spare. I have to confess that I often feel like those disciples. I see the needs of my congregation, my community, and of the people in faraway lands, and their pain moves me. And I don't always feel strong enough to answer to all of these problems. And I don't always see how my resources are going to be enough to meet all the needs of these people. And so I try to solve the problem by uniting people and putting them into teams and let's go walk for crop. But I've missed something. God doesn't expect us to bring the kingdom of God here alone. It's God's plan. It's God's compassion. And it's God's power that we participate in. God's grace is always sufficient for our needs. The miracle in this story asks me, asks all of us, to raise our eyes above our own needs and above the limits of our own resources. And the story calls us to see the world's needs and the power of our compassionate God who will take what we give and turn it into more than enough. We are called to be a compassionate community, a place where people who show the world that God is alive and God is love. Amen. Amen.